minutes ago. Welcome, LA Progressive friends, family, Rita. Dick and I are really delighted to have with us uh, Jeff Cohen. Uh, Jeff Cohen was an associate professor of journalism at Ithaca College and founder of the Media Watch Group FAIR, which is FAIR and Accuracy in Reporting. That's what that acronym stands for. In 2011, he co-founded the online activism group um, RootsAction.org, and he's the author of Cable News Confidential, My Misadventures in Corporate Media. And I strongly suggest that everybody go to RootsAction.org. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. It, it's great to be with you. I'm a big fan of LA Progressive. Oh, Thank good, you. Good. So, to, I mean, we could talk to you about lots of things. We could, we, we may get to People's College of Law, but but recently with Norman Solomon, you wrote an article about how the Democratic Party superstructure, the leaders, have have persisted in being denial in denial about what's going on with uh, Joe Biden, who, as you point out, is now even in the polls or slightly behind Donald Trump. And, and and is also considerably behind Nikki Haley uh, and is in, in jeopardy of dra dragging Democrats down at a time when the Republicans have gone crazy. It's a nightmare. You, I think there is a nightmare scenario ahead of us. And, uh, you know, so many activists for peace and justice are appalled at the state of the world and all the killing of Palestinians in Gaza with the, with the complicity of the Biden administration. But it could get worse. Right. And that's because Joe Biden has always been beholden to his big corporate donors. Some of these donors donate to Biden and the Republicans. Right. So, you know, if you're wondering why is it that these, you know, the Democratic establishment, the corporate Democrats, they can read these polls as much as you guys and I can read these polls. Uh, but I've gotten to the point where I believe they would rather lose with Biden, who they know they can control, who they know is an ally of theirs, than to risk someone that they cannot control. And so, you know, we've been fighting at Roots Action. First, we called ourselves don'trunjoe.org. Right. But now it's stepasidejoe.org. Anyone can go to that website. We've been trying to get him to step aside. We want the primaries opened up. If the primary process is opened up, all sorts of candidates would get in. The base of the Democratic Party could exercise some influence uh, on whoever the candidates are. And then, uh, as in 2020, if there's an open process, it's likely that the base of the party will people will unite behind whoever is nominated. Right now, with Biden sort of being imposed on a party where overwhelmingly most Democrats don't want him to be the candidate, the, the weirdest poll I've ever seen in my life of tracking polls was July of last year when they reported in the New York Times that 94% of Democrats under the age of 30 wanted a different candidate than Joe Biden. So there's not going to be enthusiasm behind Biden. He's lost young people, racial justice activists, even in the last couple of months because of Gaza. Arab uh, American leaders and Muslim American leaders are getting up at rallies saying no ceasefire, no vote next uh, in November of next year. So it's a it's a dire situation, and we're we're not giving up. We're still pushing on him to step aside. Yeah, I've been uh, very reluctant to to speak plainly about this, but in my opinion, what we have is a duopoly. We have two sides of the same coin. Um, one is slightly not as bad as the other when we're talking about the Democrats or the Republicans. I think you're right, Jeff, that the leaders of the Democratic Party are willing to let Joe Biden lose rather than have someone in office that they cannot control. And I think it's partly because the people who are gonna be most negatively impacted if that happens are not people that they love and care about. Right. Oh, you nailed it. I mean, look, these, these billionaires and the corporate donors, you might remember that when Biden launched his campaign for 2020 presidency, he had this meeting at the Carlisle Hotel in New York City uh, with the funders. And because Democratic activists have demanded it, when there's a private fundraiser, they always have to allow one 
pool reporter to get in. And so the pool reporter, I think she was from Reuters or Bloomberg uh, News. And uh, the report was that Biden told these donors at the beginning of his 2020 campaign, you guys won't have to worry about your income level. It's not coming down. And then he famously said, if I'm elected, nothing will fundamentally change. So you're right. The, the immigrants, uh, if Trump's reelected, Trump takes office, which is a very good possibility because of Biden and because the Democratic leadership won't open up a primary process. They won't even allow debates. He takes over again in January 2025. There will be vengeance. Immigrants will suffer. People of color will suffer. Uh, the climate will suffer because he's going to drill baby drill on day one. It's an utter nightmare scenario that we're trying to prevent. And when we write these articles, you know, people like you respond positively when Norman Solomon and I have been writing these columns all year long for a whole year. And then, but you get from the Democratic leadership, oh, you're hurting Biden. Biden is hurting himself. Yeah, yeah. And Biden, in the last couple months, the polls are showing it. Racial justice activists, Arab American activists, Muslim American activists, young people of all colors, including Jewish American young people, they are appalled by what Biden has done in Gaza. And many of them are announcing they're not voting for Biden, even if they live in swing states. You know, I'm in, I'm, uh, I vote in New York, you guys vote in California. The Democrats are going to win by 15, 20 points. But if I was in Michigan, where I'm a swing voter, as much as I have contempt for Biden, I would probably vote for whoever the Democrat is. But that's not the case for young people. You know, you can't win them over. And I was at the huge climate march uh, a couple months ago in New York City. It marched to the United Nations building. There were about 50,000 activists. Many of those activists had given up months of their lives during COVID 2020 to work for Biden to vote Trump out. And all of the placards, all the protests, and all the speakers at that climate march, and these are some of the best activists, multi-generational, multi-racial, led by Native Americans, uh, all of the placards, all the chants were aimed at Joe Biden. Biden, why are you in reverse on climate? Why are you drilling in Alaska, drilling in the Gulf, new, LNG export facilities. What are you doing? Uh, Biden, we didn't vote for more drilling. And uh, those are activists who will not be working for Biden in 2024. So unless there's a new uh, face at the head of the Democratic Party, I foresee disaster in November 2024, because it's worse than the polls. You know, the polls just show voters, many of them are not paying close attention and they're souring on Biden. But more important than the average voter, the occasional voter, the swing voter, is the activist. And the activists who get out the vote, who bring occasional voters to the polls, who get uh, people in Milwaukee, in Philadelphia, in Detroit, which is where I grew up, to the polls, you need activists to win close elections. And Biden and the Democratic leadership have lost those precious uh, get out the vote activists. Mm -hmm. So so I think I think it, it is clear that the very deep pocketed funders, the Wall Street types, the very rich, they don't really care about the outcome on the presidential race because they'll benefit either way. But the Democratic Party Act, uh, you base, know, the, the superstructure, mm -hmm. the people I see on MSNBC, th they're saying the words about how oh, we got to fight for Joe and he's really not all that old. And 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 uh, there's a reason he's doing this, that and the other. They can't be entirely blind. They, they must see the same thing you're seeing. They must see that they're not getting the donations. They're not getting the activism. Uh, they're, they, they're in danger of losing Senate seats and, and the House and it doesn't matter if, you know, you know, so, I mean, I have to believe there, there must be work being done to, to edge Joe aside. Besides I think so. I, I have not given up hope. Yeah. I mean, you know, we come at 
Joe, from a progressive perspective, he hasn't delivered for working people. He hasn't delivered for poor people. And, and we got out and worked for him and we voted for him. And we made the difference in Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania. So yeah, there's no doubt that even at the top, there've got to be people talking to Biden. I know he's got, I read that he's got a granddaughter who's a progressive activist, you know, his wife. I mean, you know, at, at, at stepasidejoe.org, I encourage people to go to that website. We haven't made an issue of his age. It's his lack of strength. It's his lack of progressive instinct and, and pro-working class instinct. Um, Mick Jagger is 80 years old. He's going on tour again, I just heard. You know what I mean? A, a Bernie Sanders is older than Biden, but he, he's got such vigor because he stands for a good progressive domestic agenda. I have some problems with Bernie on foreign policy, but you know, it, it's not his, it's not Biden's age. It's that he couldn't get the job done. You know, if Build Back Better had passed in the way that Bernie had shaped it, it would have been the greatest anti-poverty initiative, but Biden couldn't get the job done. He's not articulate. He can't use the bully pulpit to move mansion and cinema aside and get their votes and, uh, you know, beg, borrow, bribe, whatever it takes. A strong president would have passed some of these things in the first year or two that he had to keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking to the point where working class people don't think he's made their lives better. No. Poll after poll, whether, whether it's uh, people of color and, you know, they're a democratic constituency, but many of them won't vote. And then you have these white working class swing voters who go from party to party and they don't believe that Biden has delivered for them. And many of them had voted for Trump in 2016 and then Biden in 2020, and they'll probably go back to Trump. So, uh, I mean, you have to deliver. That's that's what we've always said at rootsaction.org, that neoliberalism, this incrementalism, this go slow, yes, no, status quo corporatism of a Joe Biden, neoliberalism breeds neo-fascism. If you get into power, and you, you say all these good things you're going to do, and you don't deliver, it allows these right-wing, phony populist demagogues. It's happened in country after country. It's happened in generation after generation. If you take power, promise progressive agenda, don't deliver on that agenda, uh, the right-wing populists come in with all of their uh, divisiveness, their racism, and their phony populism. I'll deliver. I'm a strong man. I'll deliver where the Democrats have failed you. And uh, it's dire. I, I have not given up hope that we can't move Biden aside, but we're running out of time. Absolutely. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that you brought up neoliberalism because we oftentimes do talk about neoliberalism here at the LA Progressive. And we, we talk about the Powell Memo and how that period from like the early 1970s, like 1970, 1971, that marked a market change in the role of corporations in the United States and their relationship with politics and their marriage uh, with politicians. Uh, before that Powell memo and its, um, its, its uh, blueprint for how corporations could have more authority before that was issued, we were on a different trajectory. Yes. It seems like all of the, the gains that were won during the 1960s, you know, the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Women's Movement, we the Vietnam, we, uh, yeah, right, <laughs> Viet, the, right, the Vietnam War, all of those victories that came out of the 60s, it appears that there was an effort that began in the 70s to undo those things. And now we're seeing the full manifestation of that effort to undo those things. So my I've, I've become a little bit more, so I'm much more cynical than, than my husband. He always says that I'm glass half empty and he's glass half full. And I say, cause that's not, cause I'm black and you're white. And I've been, <laughs> I've been seeing it for what it is for a long time. And I actually, I don't have a whole lot of hope, but what I do have hope for 
is maybe we're in a position where we can start to create a strong left movement because that's what's really lacking. We don't have a left movement, so we really can't force anybody to do anything. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I agree with your analysis. The Powell memo was a reaction to these upsurges in the 1960s. Um, as Samuel Huntington at Harvard wrote, there's just an excess of democracy. You know, <laughs> he was worried that uh, all of these groups that hadn't been in power were feeling, hey, we can take power, we can vote, we can get elected, we can change things. And if you look at, you know, I grew up in Detroit. If you look at from the 1930s and the militant socialist and labor upsurges, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, the gap between the income and wealth of the rich and the poor was shrinking. Yes. The working class was, that was becoming a middle class in some places, like Detroit, Michigan. And then neoliberalism takes over where both parties are practicing trickle down. For, you know, the Democrats always accuse the Republicans of that, but then they practice it, whether it's Clinton, Obama, or Biden. Biden's been a little better on economics than Clinton and Obama. But it's this, the neoliberalism was corporations taking control of both parties and making sure there were the uh, corporate initiatives all of the regulatory agencies, including some that came out of the 1960s were captured by these corporations. So since the eighties, you've seen this, what was once a middle class, it's just, you know, the wealth is, is just gushing upward. And that's what breeds fascist movements. When you have this much economic dislocation, so many people struggling in the what Nina Turner, you know, the poor, the working class, and the and the struggling middle class, the beleaguered middle class. That's what we have now. That's right. And the Trumps are able to appeal to, you know, largely white people, but some people of color in that struggling strata. And he does it on the basis, I'll bring you jobs. I'm ending these trade, tra you know, all these simple solutions that he never follows through with and won't follow through with if he's reelected. So yeah, neoliberalism breeds neo-fascism. We need a left independent movement. At Roots Action, you know, we, we set up ourselves in 2011 because we were concerned about Move On and other big online groups that had once been anti-war, had once been for civil liberties against spying, the state spying on activists. And then when Obama took power, when, first when Pelosi becomes the speaker and then Obama becomes the president, all of a sudden these, a lot of these peace and justice issues and, and cutting the military budget, that just went out the window. They were not talking about those issues anymore. So we formed rootsaction.org, Norman Solomon and I, because we wanted an independent left online force that was going to fight for peace and justice. And uh, whether the Democrats control Washington or the Republicans do. And there's too much of a revolving door mm -hmm. between Democratic leaders, media outlets like MSNBC, and these constituency groups that are supposed to be fighting for the working class, whether it's civil rights groups, labor unions, and big environmental groups, their leadership just, you know, when the Democrats are in power, they're over in the White House, or, and then when the Democrats lose, they're back running these groups. They are not independent. Uh, and it's why labor has been weakened, civil rights has been weakened. A lot of these constituencies, environmentalism, uh, was we can thank God we have newer groups like 350 and, and Sunrise. Uh, but even there, you wonder why aren't they speaking out against Biden when he's in reverse on climate change? So uh, we yes, Sharon, we need a more independent left movement. I'm not against working within the Democratic Party in some right. elections in some places, but the left has to be independent and has to be able to criticize the leadership of both parties or else we aren't a left. Yeah. We're just we're just an auxiliary of the Democratic Party. And I fear that's what happened to move on and a few of these other big groups. And we attempted 
to learn from what MoveOn had done and building up a big email list, but keeping principles of uh, peace, uh, racial, social justice. Uh, if you don't keep your independent principles, it's easy, easy to get sucked in to these nice sounding liberals, Democrats who don't ever deliver. Yeah, yeah. So they don't really want fundamental change. So they get those organizations get co-opted um, and, and generally they get co-opted because of a lack of funding. And yes. as funding comes in, they're co-opted and they're co-opted by people who do not want fundamental change. So you can end up with black and brown faces in high places, but no substantive change in the lives of working class people. In fact, yeah. it's continue to get worse. Yeah. So, so, so I'll have to speak up for the glass that's half full. Okay. To say that there is an opportunity now in the fact that the Republican Party is in utter dis, uh, disarray. And it seemed, I mean, and if it weren't for Biden, if there was a stronger Democratic Party, a uh, more leftist Democratic Party that would, would appeal to young people, would appeal to Black people, would appeal to young Jewish people and Muslim American people, we would be, we would be running over them. Yes, and we ought to be. Instead, Nikki Haley's ahead by 17 points, which is just horrible. So that's well, half full? That's yeah, yeah, half that full. wasn't. Well, no, the glass half full <laughs> is, that, is that this is an opportunity. Uh, I don't think the Republican Party is going to heal itself anytime soon. They've dislodged, they've d uh, discarded any moderate that you might think is a halfway reasonable person. And they mostly are being run by nutcases. Yeah, but see, the reason we started uh, Don't Run Joe, Step Aside Joe, right after the November 2022 midterms, which were not as bad as people thought they could go. In right. fact, for the party in the White House, they went pretty well. And we noticed that the Bidenites and their friends in the media were saying, see, this proves we should stick with Biden. And yet, uh, Norman and I have always loved this quote in the New York Times from an anonymous member of Congress who said, we did well in these elections in spite of Joe Biden, not because of Joe Biden, said a House Democrat who requested anonymity so as not to offend the White House. And Norman and I have been talking to mainstream reporters at the New York Times, Associated Press, they're also dumbfounded that Democrats in the House and Senate won't speak out that we need a new standard bearer because, uh, Dick, I'll agree with you on this. When it's generic D versus R, because of the extremism of the Republican Party, because of the nutcases in the Republican Party, because the Republicans are denialist when it comes to reproductive rights, they're denialist about climate. They're denialist about a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, they're denialist on, uh, I don't know if I mentioned climate. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, if it's generic Democrats versus Republicans, because of the re extremism, the Democrats are going to win. So I believe people say to me, if Joe Biden steps aside, who will be the candidate? I said, I don't care. Anyone's going to beat <laughs> Trump except for Biden. Right. Uh, you know, Gretchen Whitmer, who I'm not a huge fan of in Michigan, the governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, who I'm not a huge fan of, any of them could beat, uh, you know, could beat Trump. Because if it's a generic Democrat versus Republican, because of their extremism, and there's no person under, there's so few under 35 that go near the Republican brand. Um, but uh, Joe Biden is bringing down uh, the party. He's personally negative. He looks, you know, even the comedians who like Joe Biden's politics have to make fun of him every night. He's become sort of a national joke. Yeah. And it is stunning that the Democratic leadership is sticking with him. And it says, as Sharon said, who they care about. So, so that begs the question. So not Gretchen Whitmer, not Gavin Newsom. Who are you really enthused about? Anybody? I will be enthused about almost anyone who isn't Biden, because I believe our task to protect people of color, to protect immigrants, is we have to defeat Trump or Nikki Haley. It's probably going to be Trump. And almost any generic Democrat would do better 
Cory Booker, I think, would do better. It's hard to do worse than Biden. Right. He's just hurt. He's the incumbent now. You know, people say he beat Trump once. Why can't he beat him again? Well, he beat Trump when Trump was the whacked out incumbent who had, was full of the administration of chaos. Well, now Biden is the incumbent with an economy that while they keep telling us it's booming, it's uh, it's not booming for so many people in this country who are you know dealing with inflationary prices, which the administration, in my view, has utterly bungled. The, the way to handle inflation is the way Bernie was doing it, uh, uh, you know, handle the issue is you blame it on the, the it's greedflation. It's these, you know, these 20 uh, uh, huge grocery store chains. They're, you've got CEOs that are boasting on calls that are intercepted, calls to their investors. We're raising the prices because we can. Right. We can get away with it. And right. the corporate profits are through the roof. So uh, Bernie and a few of the progressive, the squad members, they've said this is greed, greedflation. We should put a windfall tax on, on these profiteers. I mean, imagine if Biden had started talking that way two years ago, he would have been seen as the hero fighting the big bad corporations when everyone knows the corporations have rigged the system and they've never rigged it more then when COVID began and COVID ended, they're doing great. Yeah. So uh, I just feel he's bungled every issue. Um, he's turned off his own base. Almost any, uh, some of the senators that ran the last time, I don't think Kamala Harris would do any better. She's got the Biden taint. Um, and she didn't do well the first time she ran, nor did some of these others who are gonna run again if Biden were to step aside. Uh, uh, but I, I'm I'm optimistic that if you have an open primary process, because say Biden steps aside on Christmas Day, the base of the party, which is motivated by issues, we care about saving the people of Gaza. We care about racial justice. We care about climate. We would be making demands on these five or 10, 12 candidates who would immediately get in the race. And we would demand uh, that they make pledges to us. And so when the base of the party is involved, you'll get a better outcome. Uh, and, you know, Biden ran as uh, much more progressive than he wanted to because he had to accommodate all the Bernie activists. And in that first year, if he wasn't such a weak president, he would have been able to uh, push uh, Manchin or Cinema aside and actually accomplish the, the Bernie domestic agenda. Right. Uh, which he came close to, but failed. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have, I'm have. i optimistic, even if we ended up with President Gavin Newsom, that would be much better than uh, Biden because it, it looks like we're going to end up with President Donald Trump in January 2025. That's my nightmare. Well, well, I, I have to agree with you, Jeff. Unfortunately, I wish I didn't. But let's let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk a little bit about People's College of Law which is my alma mater and, and yours too. Um, were you with the first uh, year they graduated? No, from I, I came there in 1775. 1775? <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I'm not that old. <laughs> my daughters would say I'm that old. Um, yeah, in uh, 1975, I think the school started in fall of 74. Mm -hmm. So I was basically there at the yeah. beginning. It was so exciting. A law school aimed at people of color, yeah, and people that didn't go to uh, you know fancy undergrads. That's right. Indeed, I went there, and I only had two years of undergrad. Yeah, and most law schools wouldn't have taken me. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was an amazing thing. Many of us that are in the bar because of that school. It's I still make uh, you know my meager donations. I sign the petitions. But I know the bar uh, wants to put an end to it, and you know, yeah, students—they students, actually made that decision yesterday. And and but will it at least exist until these? So seven. There were seven students. They will allow. Um, well, I I spoke with one of the students today. One of the seven is not in his fourth year. He's he's in his third third year, which is not his final year. They will allow him to complete his third year but he still has another year to go and they're not going to allow it. 
Now, I don't know, and that decision was made yesterday. I don't know if there's an opportunity to appeal that decision. Um, he said he'd get back to me later on today. Yeah, it's so it's so sad. I mean, I look around, you know, I, I left LA to start FAIR, the Media Watch Group in 1986 in New York City, but I've always been in LA. I've always come back. And to see these graduates who are the leaders of labor unions and the state assembly, yes, it's so exciting. And Maria Elena Durazo is our state senator. For That's right. The area I mean, that we live in. Yeah, it's, yeah and, and Ken Wong is a, is a great friend of ours. Right, and a lot of the professors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if I'm right, Ken Wong was one of the professors. Right. I don't know if Ken was a, a professor, but he heads up the UCLA um, Labor yeah. Center. Yeah. Um, I was yeah. a professor there for seven years. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it was a great institution. I was talking about it last night. Um, when I took trial practice, uh, my professor was the late uh, Leonard Wineglass, mm -hmm. who had defended the Pentagon Papers, defended the Chicago 8. Wow. Um, it, yeah, People's College of Law will always be near and dear to me. And it's sad. And I just... I hope these stu these eight students can at least get a chance at taking the bar. Yeah. Uh, and that's not easy. Sometimes people have to take it a, a few times, but I'd love to see some of those eight get into the bar. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Well, we'll keep you posted on that. LA yeah. Progressive is covering that story. Well, Jeff, right. it's been a real pleasure uh, chatting with you this afternoon. I wish the, the circumstances were, <laughs> yeah. were better yeah. than they are. But, well, I know I know three people that are on this Zoom that are doing our best to make a brighter future, and you, you got to fight and fight and fight, and that's what you guys do at LA Progressive, and I I congratulate you for what you've accomplished. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you. So this was a lot of fun. We'll be sure to do it again sometime. We'll call sure. you again. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks, Thanks a lot. So long. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.